Hey, everybody. Welcome to Connecting Cannabis, brought to you by Razzle. I'm your host, Brian Holler. Uh, today, we are here with Sheila Gibson, founder, Aura IP Law. Hello, Sheila. Always good to Hello. see you. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Oh, you know, good. Hanging in there. It's, uh, it's Monday, a little overcast here in uh, Southern California today, so uh, kind of an interesting Monday. Um, how about yourself? Um. About the same, yeah. It was pouring pretty hard this morning. Right now it looks fairly clear, but I like the yeah. rain. My succulents need some water, so I'm going to pull them all out in a minute. There you go. That's another wrong with that, exactly. Um, and yeah, gosh knows we could use some water down here, so that's uh, never a bad thing. So let's hop right into it. Um, you know, obviously the name of your company is Aura IP Law, so, you know, uh, intellectual property is a... Um, big piece, if not the, you know, uh, bulk of what you do for your clients. Um, but before we kind of dig into some minutia around that, um, what is intellectual property, you know, like for the, the 10,000 foot version? The 10,000 foot version is actually really similar to real property. So, um, the same way that you have your house or your car and you bought a door lock or maybe an alarm system, maybe some cameras, to protect your property, intellectual property in terms of lo the legal standpoint is protecting your intellectual property the same way you would real property so that you are deciding, for example, who can use it. Um, you know, going back to the house analogy, so who can come into my house? Do I let everybody into my house? Do I only let certain people into my house? Do I charge some people to come in for a party? Or does everybody get to come in for free? Do they get to stay a while? Um, you become the owner, you become the person who controls the access to what you've created. And so the intellectual component of intellectual property is creation. So things that you've created, um, whether they are business names, um, ideas, uh, devices, processes, um, even artistic works, all of that is, are things that are created of the mind. So that's the intellectual component. And then the property is the same as the real property component. Sure. Um, and so what's the, um, I guess, is there a nuance or a difference between trademarking and, and intellectual property? Um, yeah. So there are four distinct types of intellectual property. Uh, the first are, they, these are not in any particular order, but one is patents and that's for ideas. So any idea that is both new, so it's never been disclosed before and new is a really low hurdle to to cross. So it just has to be different in one way from something that's been done before. And then it also has to be non-obvious. And that's where, you know, minor differences are not enough. So the difference that you have from what's already known, or what's already done in the art, is that it has to be a non-obvious difference. So something in that perspective is from someone of ordinary skill in the art. So someone who's equally equipped as you are, um, was it obvious to them to make the change that you made? Um, and then the third hurdles or the other hurdles for patentability have to do with, you have to disclose it in a way to enable somebody to make and use it. So you have to teach somebody how to make and use your invention. And in exchange for doing that, you get a monopoly, a, a limited term monopoly, 20 years from your filing date where you can exclude others. You don't have to exclude others, but you can exclude others from making, using, selling your invention. So that's patents. Yep. Uh, trademarks has to do with anything that identifies the source of, um, your, of your goods or services. So right. I am a service provider. The name or IP law identifies the source of the goods you know that they're coming from my law firm. If I also have a slogan, uh, that can also be used. Other things that can be uh, considered for trademark protection include colors so tiffany blue is a color Scents. play-doh has a oh, yeah. scent of play-doh that's right protected by trademark wow. sounds so the sound of a lightsaber is protected sure. by trademark so anything that uniquely the key there is it has to uniquely identify you so yeah. if if your trademark is not unique enough it won't be provided trademark protection sure and then there is copyrights and copyrights are for more artistic works, literary works, photographs, um, expression of ideas. So not the ideas themselves, but the way that you choose to express them, either written 
um, or, you know, video. Sure. So that's all protectable by copyright. Even buildings are protectable by copyright. Their design features. Um, and then there's trade secrets. And trade secrets is the counterpart or the flip side of patents, where rather than disclosing to others how to make and use your invention, you choose to keep a secret. Um, those secrets are protectable under trade secret law, provided that you took all of the necessary steps to keep them secret. Right. Um, so, like the formula for Coca Cola, for instance, exactly. or something like that, right? Yeah. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up for everybody to hear is because, um, you know, as you and I have discussed previously, Sheila, there's going to be a lot more people investing in like intellectual property in a sense um, due to the current environment. Um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit first. Um, how are you seeing your clients uh, adjust um, to um, kind of COVID and the new, uh, the new normal, as we say? One of the things that I'm seeing everybody doing, and, and this really excites me from an intellectual property standpoint, is everybody is pivoting their businesses. People aren't just sitting idle. Um, you guys, for you know, perfect model. So everybody's pivoting to an online structure or some other way they can provide their goods or services to everybody who's you know staying home sure. because of the quarantine. And what's exciting about that is people are creating intellectual property, whether you've chosen a new name for your business or this component of your business. Yeah. Um, if you've invented a new way of doing business, if you've invented and you know, you have a new service, you maybe some people have changed up their goods, but a lot of what I'm seeing is probably at least an evaluation of whether or not you have something that you would like to protect a trademark. Um, a lot of people have, come up with really clever names for their new service models. Yep. Um, and those are things that they should really be thinking about, whether at least be doing an, in, an internal IP audit on what is the new intellectual property you've created, and then asking whether or not that's something that you should consider protecting with IP protection. Sure. So it's really a time to kind of um, not just look at what you're doing in the future, but look at all, what you already have. Uh, and right. make sure that things are, you know, buttoned up accordingly. Um, and if not, then you might want to talk to someone like Sheila um, exactly. to help you, um, which you can absolutely do. And she's fantastic, as you guys are plainly seeing here. Um, and so um, have you, let's see, have you seen an uptick in any kind of uh, specific types of, you know, IP uh, that are being kind of pushed out more? Like, is it more um, creative-based type things, or are people really, really constructing new services or different alternative kind of um, products to, uh, to put out? I think there's both. I mean, anytime you have people stay at home and they don't have anything to do, right, everyone goes into creative mode. People right. are thinking, what, what am I going to do? What am, what am I going to do next? So I think we're going to see from this a lot of intellectual property come out of it, whether it's somebody invented something while they were at home in their garage tinkering or, um, you know, you decided that a certain platform you're using for this new way of doing business isn't working. So you tinkered it and made it better. Sure. Um, so you're going to see a lot of people who are solving a lot of problems right now. And that's where intellectual property all comes from in terms of patents. So I, I expect to see a lot more patent filings after this. Um, I also expect to see a lot of trademark filings. Again, different names for your new ways of doing business. Um, new businesses created around this yep. uh, businesses that were just barely taking off and are now exploding. So yep. I'm sure zoom already had all of their um, <laughs> trademarks, but let's I would say, assume so, but they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're having a new round here. Right? I would guess. Let's, <laughs> let's yeah. say they were a startup and hadn't taken all of that into consideration. Oh. Now out of nowhere, there's this huge boom in their business. That's right. And so they probably are really quickly, you know, if they hadn't, we're using this hypothetically, but if they hadn't, they would be really quickly contacting their lawyers and making sure that all their intellectual property is tightened up. Um, another thing that I, that I am seeing already and I expect to see a lot of is content creation. Yeah. So there's, everybody is moving their business to an online platform. And so in order to do that, you're putting all of your information online. What are you doing to protect it? Maybe you're just going to be the first, you know, there's a couple different ways. Maybe you're going to be the first and the best. Everybody's going to go to you. And really it's about identifying you as a source, which is a trademark, yep. or it might be, you know, I, I'm not 
there's going to be a lot of people competing with me in this space. And so I want to protect the way that I'm doing it, the way that I'm presenting the information with copyrights. Sure. Or I want to protect my videos with copyrights. I want to protect my website with copyrights. Um, whether that's just marking it with a circle C, which everybody should be doing, everyone. Um, or it, and, and it's real simple to do. It's the circle C, the year, and your name is all that you need. The name of the entity that owns that copyright. That's all that you need for copyright protection. Um, and the owner of the copyright is, is the author of the copyright. So the person who took the picture, the person who wrote the blog piece, the person, um, and then they can assign it to the entity if, if need be. Um, but, you know, then step further, if there's something you think people might take, then actually taking the step to register the copyright. Going to www.copyright.gov, register your copyright. So, so that's, a, that's an important distinction, Sheila. So, um, right, so you're saying that if I create a piece of um, content that, uh, that is regular, that's unique to my business or me, um, there's a way I can protect myself straight away. Right. Yes. I can add a copyright, right? Get the circle C, the year, and then whatever entity produced it, whether that's your own business, your company you work for, et cetera. Right. So that gives you a, a certain layer of protection that you don't need a, a you know, a, a, an expert to do that for you. You can just do it. Right. But there is another layer after that. Uh, if you really do feel like you have something that's um, maybe growing, maybe at first that's a good way to go. And then as it grows and it starts to become, kind of bigger, more unique to you as you dive into the uniqueness, right? Um, would you, and so that there's this other layer that you have to ba basically be aware of as a content creator. Right. And the key is that the co every, every piece of uh, every literary work or every um, artistic work, let's call it, it has copyright protection as soon as it's, they call it fixed in a tangible medium. So as soon as you, as you fin take the picture, that's the easy one. As soon as you finish the work of art, as soon as you finish the, you know, the, the content that you're putting on your website, it already has copyright protection. The key is if you want to, if you're ever going to get to the point of suing over it, if you're ever going to have to sue somebody for infringement of your copyright, it does need to be registered first. And so you do have to be a little bit um, proactive in deciding what, what might be something that somebody would steal and right. that you're going to need to pursue. Um, and then if you're sending a cease and desist letter, for example, it would be nice to be able to send a cease and desist and provide your copyright registration number, which also entitles you to statutory damages. So there are statutory damages you can get when you have taken that extra step to get the registered copyright. That is very interesting, especially in the land of kind of digital and social where, some people will put out content and want folks to share it and want folks to, to do that. Some person might, some company might put exact sort of same kind of thing out and want it all protected and don't you dare, you know, share anything. So that's something for all of us out there to be very, very cognizant of as we're, um, you know, partnering with people and we're making uh, arrangements with um, different right. uh, businesses and sharing content and things of that nature. Right. And you just, the thing that I, I think is key is you want to be the one in control of how your content is distributed. If you, if you want it to be shared, if you don't want it to be shared, if you want it to be shared only with credit. But the key is if you're taking those steps in advance and knowing how you're distributing your information and protecting it in a way that aligns with your goals for the information, or your goals for the content, then that's, you know, I'd rather have people empowered and make these decisions than have them being made for them. Absolutely, and I think everybody would agree, at least I certainly would hope so. Um, you know, that's a great, basically, that's a good reason behind why you should do it, because you just wanna be in control of what your business or your company, your brand, you know, is putting out there. And right. the best way to do it is to be basically protected from a legal standpoint. And there's nothing that says that if you take these steps to secure your trademark registration, secure your copyright registration, secure a patent, there's nothing that says that you then have to hoard it and you don't let anybody else use it. And, you don't, and that's, it's about control the same way that your front door gives you control to your house. It's sure. about controlling who has access. Do you want these types of entities to be able to use it, but not these types, you know, and, in cannabis, do you want, you know, 
other cannabis operators and pioneers to be able to use it, but not big pharma. I mean, right. there's something everyone talks about big pharma and not wanting them to come in and take over, but what are you doing to make sure they can't? Because this yeah. is the game that big pharma is going to play with you. Oh, yes. And I think that's important to denote for, uh, especially cannabis business owners as we move forward. Um, you know, we get closer to legalization, things of that nature, because once that happens, you're right. Uh, what, whatever your opinion is on, you know, big pharma or whatever is inconsequential, um, you want to protect your own business. You need to, you want to have control over whether you let those folks in or whether you, you know, keep them out. And the only way to do that is from, you know, a legal standpoint is to, to get with your IP attorney and your trademark attorney, a great one like Sheila, and, you know, and, and work it out. Well, and the other thing is you want to have this leverage. So you want to, if you're going to do a negotiated deal with yeah. a big company, you want, you know, they're going to bring intellectual property to the table. Are you going to bring some as well? Um, right. It's a negotiating tool. It's a tool for investors. Investors more and more are going to want to see intellectual property. They're going to want to know there's a way for them to recoup their investment. Is there a way for them to exclude others? Can they exclude competitors that they have in mind? Um, do you have the tools in place that will allow that to happen um, that will make them feel more comfortable investing money or is your idea one that there's no way to protect it and you're going to have everybody competing with you in the marketplace? Right. Um, an investor might not want to take that gamble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's all about transparency when it comes to investors. Uh, and, you know, if you can be transparent and legally you know, buttoned up as we like to say at Razzle, but ultimately that's why, and Sheila, you know this because we you know, know each other, but that's one of the things that we're always helping our clients to remind, to remember to do is as they're preparing their, you know, a lot of documentation and, and, and material for investors to consider, um, not to mention the things from a legal standpoint that you just have to have. Um, and these are, um, I think, I think maybe people forget about some of these parts um, and they can't, uh, especially when it comes to, um, you know, protecting your property, like you're saying, trademarks and patents. Um, obviously, in cannabis, super important, you know. Um, right. if, you're not, if you're not protected from that angle, you know, you're really doing yourself and your company a disservice. And um, no matter what happens, at least it, se it seems to me that uh, you bring up a great point. Like at Razzle, we're always coaching everybody to be kind of um, ready. Uh, because you never know who's going to be there and want to want to really get into your business. And um, again, better to be prepared. Exactly. Better, be, better be ready for it. So um, is that kind of how you've, um, I mean, obviously you've been working in this for uh, quite some time. Um, are you seeing any specific pivots or uh, specific kind of things uh, in cannabis specifically um, over the last say three weeks, four weeks, uh, given, you know, kind of the, the nature of how things are changing. Well, you know, cannabis is now an essential service. Yeah. And so I see a lot of opportunity there, um, a lot of promise. Uh, it's still going to face the same hurdles because uh, you know, still the small business loans, things of that nature, sure. at least so far, aren't going to cannabis operators. Yeah. Um, I hope to see that change, but yeah, there's still you know, a little I, bit of hope there, isn't there? I think there's, I think they're fighting against that. Correct. Yeah. There's definitely yeah. a fight. It's, yeah. there's a lot of attorneys, um, colleagues of mine who are involved in that. So I hope that. to see that change, but, um, I do see, you know, now that, that it's, it's deemed essential, you know, I think that did help a lot with yeah. the reputation of cannabis and just for people who I know that myself, I had some people who weren't, we're sort of easing into the idea of, of cannabis as medicine. Sure. And um, I think that really pushed them to the other side of, yes, I'm ready to try. Um, yep. And so I think that we, you know, cannabis has a, a huge boom in sales right now. Yep. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful that these businesses will reinvest in themselves and, you know, start producing more uh, intellectual property, whether it's new formulations new um, products, new product designs, yep. um, and just really focus on their brands and, and how are they going to stand out from, from all of the other cannabis brands. Um, and that's really important to do, I think. And now I think is the time, it, it's a really good time for cannabis to, to make its mark. 
It is. I agree. And uh, I, I feel like it's on all fronts as well. You know, um, investors are very interested in cannabis right now because of many of the things that you were just saying. Um, they already were. Um, but this actual, this shift actually makes the market even more appealing for them, uh, especially if your head's in the right direction and, and you really are supporting the um, cannabis space as a whole. This is a time to get in. Um, and it's also a time if you're a business owner to protect yourself. Uh, and no better person to uh, talk to than Sheila Gibson from RIP Law to do that. So um, on that note, on a great note, uh, Sheila, let's make sure that everybody knows where they can find you out there. You can find me at auraiplaw.com. That's A-U-R-A-I-P law.com. And my Instagram is where I post a lot of free tips, content, um, and that's Aura IP Law, all one word. And those are my current places you can find me. And stay tuned because I am going to be starting launching a podcast soon. Nice. Uh, with a lot of the same or similar content. And I'm also launching another aspect of my business, which will provide webinars and courses and um, just different types of downloads and things to help make intellectual property more accessible. Um, I'm sensitive to the fact that small businesses have been hit pretty hard. I'm one myself. And so my pivot has been that I'm going to create this content at a lower price point or more accessible price point. It'll be a little bit of a, a do it yourself model, or if you choose after viewing that to decide to hire me, apply that toward my fees. But um, I'm definitely trying to do my part to have businesses protect themselves and make it something that is at the forefront of people's minds rather than an afterthought. You know, I don't, I, it's so much better for me to be involved in helping you file a, a clean trademark application than helping you because someone else filed for your mark first or right. helping you because you received a cease and desist letter. Yeah. Um, so I, I do that. I'm happy to do that. I do a lot of that. I, I like to see people become more proactive about their intellectual property, especially in the cannabis space. Very good. Um, and on that note, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, thank make you sure for having to, me. to find uh, Sheila everywhere. And I look forward to seeing uh, or uh, learning more about your podcast and that new uh, services you're providing. Now you'll have to come back on and talk about that here in a few weeks. So um, be you. well. Absolutely. Take care. Always good to see right. you. Bye. Bye-bye.